of the School of Eternal Life coming to you live wherever you are, courtesy of the Cry of the Spirit Ministries Global, here in Nairobi, Kenya. Ministering under God is opposed to Richard E. S. De King, the privileged apostolic leader. Apostolic Parental Advisory Any preacher who is not eternity conscious cannot form Christ in people. Any church that does not purify you will desecrate you. You don't need prayers, deliverance services, and prophets prophesying to you, prayer partners, or prayer points. You need sound doctrine. If you keep the Bible aside, you have simply stepped aside. He began ministry as a local prayer and church intercession team leader and later grew up to become an evangelist participating actively in rural crusade evangelism from the year 1993. He later became a local church pastor in the year 1996 and was commissioned into independent ministry by the year 2000. Since then, he has served in many different capacities in God's kingdom. He is a husband, father, author of many spiritual reformatory books, a teacher of God's word, God's kingdom media personality, a resident pastor and spiritual authority to many warriors of righteousness that are across the nations. Apostle Richard Takim is currently serving as an apostolic leader of the Cry of the Spirit Ministries Global from its operational base stationed in Nairobi, Kenya. Foundly known as Apostle by Content, he is currently the overseer of the Morning Cloud TV. Bad things are still going to happen, but we shall experience greatest lifting in the midst of crisis by tapping into profession from unexpected ends. It's a very special book brought to us titled Provisions from Unexpected Aids. It's a book that will strengthen you to run against the troops and leap over the walls. It is what you know that determines how you run. The righteous are redeemed by knowledge. If you are only praying without knowledge, you will be knocked down in the day of temptation because your spirit ain't fortified with knowledge. Provisions from Unexpected Ends is an amazing book. When you sit with this book, Provisions from Unexpected Ends, you are actually schooling in the spirit. And now, we introduce to you the latest book from God's Kingdom Scribe, a spiritual father, Apostle Richard E. S. Takame. This book will show you how to tap into the very word of God and pull down the needed peace, joy, abundance, and the very provision we need in the midst of a crisis. Get your copy today. Keeper of his covenant. You sent this scroll to deliver people from the false grace movement. You said to me that I should dig the well of revival. That you be my witness so I can be your witness. And whoever will read this will catch the revival fire, Amen. will be delivered from the false grace movement. Amen. Spirit Online Radio, invading darkness with the voice of the Lord. How do you know that you have departed from the faith? 
when you can no longer stand sound doctrine, when you treat sins with kids' gloves, when you start thinking that deliverance prayers will be the answer to your problems, when you want to do the work of God without doing His Word, if a message that warns you about hell evokes resentment in your heart against the preacher, Whenever this happens, disconnect from everything and stay connected to the Morning Cloud TV and let Jesus minister to you. The hearts of many in our age are so filled with gross darkness. Many can no longer tell the difference between light and darkness. Yes, yes. the stage is set for Jesus to be revealed. Jesus to be revealed. The stage is set for Jesus to show himself and let us know through the demonstration of his power and glory the difference between light and darkness. The greatest need of your life is not marriage, money, freedom from generational curses or evil altars, but the fullness of God resting over your life and making things happen. If you wish to wear a crown, you must first carry a cross. It is possible with the Morning Cloud Television. Spirit Online Radio, invading darkness with the voice of the Lord. Apostolic Parental Advisory Any preacher who is not eternity conscious cannot form Christ in people. Any church that does not purify you will desecrate you. You don't need prayers, deliverance services and prophets prophesying to you, prayer partners or prayer points. You need sound doctrine. If you keep the Bible aside, you have simply stepped aside. Welcome to the 6th of our July edition of the School of Eternal Life. My name is Richard E. Astake, the privileged apostolic leader of the Crow of the Spirit Ministries. I believe that your heart is ready and your spirit is hungry for the word of the Lord. It is those who are hungry and tasty for, righteous, for righteousness that shall be filled. Uh, in the kingdom of God, expectations are very, very important. They are the triggers of uh, we connecting God. Because the Bible says that the expectation of the righteous shall not be cut off. And the people who are hungry and tasty for more of God, they are naturally filled. Because their hunger and their taste 
has a way of attracting divinity to their lives. That's how you see uh, ordinarily fasting and prayer supposed to be a, a demonstration of one's hunger for more of God or a burden out of your heart and things like that. Uh, 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 there are people who just fast as a formula for getting things done. But there are those who fast as an expression of their deep hunger for God. And the first thing that you do as an expression of deep hunger for God brings so much blessing to your life. It's been a beautiful um, journey with God from Monday, it was kick-started on Sunday actually, where we, has, we had those wonderful testimonies and the marvelous deeds that God uh, has been doing. And uh, since then, God has been unfolding truth upon truth on matters of prophetic acts, matters of timeless ordinances that so many preachers of our age have used to enrich themselves. They have used it to enthrone themselves over the fortune of people, over the misfortune of people also. So they have used the fortune and the misfortune of people to make themselves relevant, to make themselves rich. And because of the powers that do manifest through these so-called prophetic acts and timeless ordinances, people believe in them. We live in a generation, ordinarily human being, one of the, one of the consequences of the fall of man on the human race is the, 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 we, I mean, we always ascribe any supernatural to be God. We always ascribe any problem solving to be God. So we feel that it's only God that solves problems. No, no, that the devil also solves problems. It's just that the problem that the devil solves are preparation for sudden destruction. If Satan was not solving problems, he would not have worshippers. No human being will follow what is not making sense to them and what is not solving their problems. So if you think that problem, every problem solving is from God, then you are naive, you are ignorant. Not every problem solving is from God. So the fact that um, the so-called prophetic acts and the so-called timeless ordinances solved problems does not mean that it is of God. The spirit of lawlessness has been on the loose. The mystery of iniquity has been something that the end time church, many believers have been romancing with. And it's very scary because Matthew chapter 7 made it clear that people, Christians will go to hell for practicing lawlessness. You see, there was something I demonstrated on Sunday when I spoke about our works not being perfect before God. I know a lot of preachers, that knowledge will be hidden from them. But I want to submit to you that any day Christ himself confronts you about the ministry, about your ministry, and show you that it is not perfect before him, honestly, you will change all you are doing. If you have the seed of God in you. Sadly speaking, for many, they want to see Jesus entering their house and not talking to them. They don't, they don't recognize those that he sent to them. Some of us have been sent, but some people don't understand. They try to teach us how to relay the message that, our, that the messenger sent us. <laughs> and they try to cancel us. You don't cancel a prophet how to prophesy. Just keep your mouth shut. You don't cancel a prophet how to prophesy. Those of you who are thinking that, oh, why didn't you call these preachers aside and talk to them? You don't tell a prophet how to prophesy. It's like telling Ezekiel, why didn't you call the irresponsible shepherd aside and tell them what they are doing is not good. You see, you don't tell a prophet how to prophesy. Just keep your mouth shut if you don't understand what God is doing. Are you understanding me? A whole lot of people have been killed. People are dying. People are exploited. Souls are going to hell because of this public presentation of another gospel. By the time we wrap up tomorrow, you will realize that, by now you must have realized that most of what is called prophetic act in the church today is magic. 
most of what is called ordinances are all magic. These guys are magicians. They have mixed anointing. Those who are called of God have a mixed anointing because they were not trained of God. I told you before, the most dangerous man of God is a true man of God who is doing the wrong thing. He is called of God but not trained of God. So he ends up with a mixed anointing. Even when he practices magic, you will know that this is magic. The difference between miracles and magic is miracles from God draws your attention to God and form Christ in your character. Magic draws your attention to the preacher and make you committed to his ministry. You become like an occultic person. You get my point? And they begin to threaten you what will happen if you leave. So there's a lot of magic today that is being uh, uh, demonstrated as um, as um, um, as prophecy, and you must get this thing straight. So today we'll be looking at Bible truths on the anointing oil. The topic that is on the screen now is not for today; it's for tomorrow. So please remove it. We'll be looking at Bible truths on the anointing oil because we saw issues of altars yesterday. By tomorrow, we'll look at Bible sense of prophetic acts. So today is Bible truth of the anointing oil, and um, that, that will be part six of um, uh, Bible sense of, uh, of prophetic acts and timelines, or, or that is part six of it. So we'll be looking at Bible truth of the anointing oil. On the anointing oil, today is a part one of it. By God's grace, in the morning session of tomorrow, I will bring the part two, then the afternoon session, will now look at Bible sense of prophetic acts. There's going to be an explosion of power among us as God begins to demonstrate the Bible sense of prophetic acts tomorrow. You get my point? But today, we want to begin a journey, Bible truth on the anointing of year part one. Then tomorrow morning, I will bring the part two of it. The reason why we are looking at Bible truth of, of the anointing of year is because, remember you say we look at the altars. Today, for two days, we'll be looking at altars. And one thing you should understand is that from the beginning, from the point in Mount Sinai where Jesus descended upon the, on, on Mount Sinai literally, where Jesus descended literally on Mount Sinai, there was no symbols. Now, from the time that the people told him that they don't want uh, Moses, they don't want Jesus to be talking to them directly, that they want Moses to be talking to them. So everything changed and symbols began. We're going to go for a short break and when we come back, I will pick. There's something that is not right here in the studio. So we'll go on a short break. When we come back, I'll pick from where I stop. Sorry for the interruption. I'll be back. of many in our age are so filled with cross darkness many can no longer tell the difference between light and darkness yes yes the stage is set for Jesus to be revealed, Jesus to be revealed. the stage is set for Jesus to show himself and let us know through the demonstration of his power and glory the difference between light and darkness the greatest need of your life welcome back like I was saying, from the moment that 
Christ, the Israelite told Christ that they want Moses to be talking to them. Now everything switched. God's redemption plan changed. Now listen, don't be a Christian that just limits himself to what to the little, little scripture that your pastor is reading every Sunday. A lot of preachers don't know the Bible. I have, you see, from my personal study of the world, I remember the season I used to spend 12 hours a day, even beyond on the Bible. It opened my eyes to see how wrong many mega churches are. All these fame preachers that you celebrate, that if you call your name, you start getting angry at us. They are very wrong. They don't know the Bible. If you have not studied this book, let's, let, me, let me not say 12 hours a while I did. Just do it six hours a day for six years. You will see how the church has been misled by, by so-called spiritual fathers. They don't even have time to read their Bibles. They don't study. They read other books. They don't study the Bible. So a lot of preachers are ignorant. As a result, a lot of Christians are ignorant. Believers have been kept around few scriptures that they use, but they don't teach. So when we come out with truths like this, it, it creates a shock in the heart of people. And the first thing they do, they start insulting us and say, we are devils, we are that. B because they are ignorant, stupidly ignorant. It's very annoying that you have the Bible in your hand and you don't know anything about it. Do you think Christ will be happy with you? And the Bible says he is the word of God. So, that's why we are taking our time in this school to investigate, to check the word concerning all these uh, magical practices they call prophetic acts. Let me tell you something. How will you call a prophet calling a pregnant woman publicly, prophet, quote unquote, and asking her to lie down with her tummy up, how do you call that prophetic acts? How do you call a preacher lying down on a woman publicly, I mean lying down on a woman mouth to mouth, body to body publicly, how do you call that prophetic act? How do you call the drinking of oil prophetic acts? Those are magical acts that people are coming prophet, calling prophetic acts. Today, as we begin to look at the Bible truths on the anointing oil, you will see, <laughs> God, I wish, the things I want to share today, there are some I've never shared anywhere in the world. So give me your attention. I've spoken about God's replacement for the anointing oil, but there are truths I have never shared about. Because of all this nonsense people are doing, I'm being provoked to bring out things which I've not brought out. I would say the Spirit of God is being provoked to bring out things that have not been brought out on the anointing oil. So give me your attention tonight. Because the Bible says, whatsoever is exalted among men, it's an abomination in the sight of God. Look at the way the anointing oil has been exalted. They fight for it. They hold on to it tenaciously. They insult any preacher who come against them that they're using it. I, I can't forget the meeting I attended. Um, in the, I sneak into the meeting in, a, in, 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 in Kaduna there in 1999 where, where, where Bishop Edipo stood and was very angry at one of the pastors in Lagos that preached against the use of oil, and he called him devil. I can't forget that meeting. I can't forget that meeting. Why, why do they hold so strong to the use of oil that anybody who comes with a scripture that denounces it, they attack the person furiously? Why? Why is it that when it comes to the use of oil, they don't apply self-control? They don't apply the, the, the fruit of the spirit, which is love. But they expect you, who is exposing the error, to apply the fruit of the spirit. But them, they don't. Not knowing that you are actually applying the fruit of the spirit, but another dimension of God's love. You see, there are two sides of God's love. There's a side that chastises and rebukes and exposes things. The church is not aware of that type. Oh, correcting in love. Do you know the meaning of correcting someone in love? 
Do you know the meaning of correcting someone in love? How did Ezekiel correct the, the irresponsible shepherd in love? You see, rebuke is a dimension of love that the church is not aware of. Exposing of evil is a dimension of love that the church is not aware of. That is correcting in love. Rebuking, exposing. Listen carefully. Why is it that the use of oil, people fight, and they do all kinds of things, you will discover. So the reason why I'm talking about oil is because from chapter 20 of Exodus, where the, where the people now say they don't want Jesus, Prince Christ, to speak to them directly. Moses should be the one. Everything changed. I've shown you that. Now, God now began to speak to Moses. And can I tell you a secret? There's a danger, not too much. The reason why you see prophets of old, before they are called into the, before the mantle of God drop upon them. For instance, Elisha, we're going to see Elijah to, Elisha today. For instance, Elisha, for 20 years, he was being trained and being trimmed by God through Elijah. Why did God take that long to raise a prophet? It's because it is, for lack of better times, it is very dangerous for God to speak to a man through a man. I repeat, it is very dangerous for God to speak to a man through a man. I'm going to explain. Very dangerous. That is why initially, God wanted to speak to man directly. Now, let's begin from the natural. Do you know that people can be misquoted? Do you know that when I, when I say something to you and I ask you to go and tell this person what I've said, you, you get there, you could misquote me, or you could add your own, or you could present in such a way that I did not present it. Now, by the time that person carried to the next person, before you know, the, the, the truth in what I've said will be diminishing. People will be adding their own. And by the time you get to the 10th person, the message I gave originally had been lost completely. That is why I say it is dangerous for God to speak to a man through a man. God wants to talk to everybody directly. But it is men that are not ready. So what God now does, he will prepare his prophet to make sure that by the time he starts using the prophet, the person will speak as an oracle, not a diviner they call oracle today. In another word, he will speak without adding his own. He will speak the way God presented it. He will not have had his own ideas. He will not add his, his own anything. But can I tell you something? In spite of how God trained his prophet, still, what God tell the prophet to tell us, by the time the prophet is bringing it out, at least 10% of it or 15% of it is lost. That's why you see Paul say, we see it as in a mirror. 10% of it or 15% of it is, is lost. Can I tell you something? The reason why, personally, I prefer standing on the scriptures is because this is, the Bible calls it the most sure word of prophecy. You, things cannot be lost here because it's already written. So we only need to be inspired by the Holy Spirit to comprehend what is in this book. One day I sat before, that was, I think that was 2001, I sat before a young man that was preparing for ministry and he brought a book of prophecy that a prophetess in their ch ch church have his prayer partner told him about his calling. And I brought the one that he himself was studying the Bible and he understood. When I look at it, I, me and him discovered that the one he studied the Bible and understood was more accurate than the one that the woman prophesied to him. Because when people are prophesying to you, they add their own things, mostly. There's always a stain. Are you, are, you, are you understanding me? Except they are trained. So God wants to speak to us directly so that the potency of his message will remain, so that the truth in his message will not be lost. But our laziness will not let it happen. Do you know that when God is speaking to you through a lawyer, the concept of law will stain what God is saying? When God is speaking to you through a, a medical doctor, the concept of medicine will stain what God is saying. A man's training always, always, always influences 
any message he's releasing to you from God. That is why most times you see God using the illiterate because they have not been subjected to any training. So as a result, the training God gives them becomes the ultimate training that influences whatever they are doing. I'm not saying you should go and be an illiterate because most lying prophets today, if you go and change it, they didn't even go to school. Their illiteracy is the reason why they touch the demonic. So both ends. I'm not, I'm not against education, my friend. Just get what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the reason why the symbols began to appear after they told God that they don't want to hear from him directly again was because God was not speaking through human vessels. Human vessels have human cultures. Human cultures have human traditions. They have human concepts. So human concept, human traditions, human culture become the carrier of God's voice. As a result, a stain begin to appear. And that stain that began to appear over the years, it built and built and built and became a platform for the spirit of error. So, with that understanding, when God began to speak, the first thing he spoke, he spoke to Moses, Moses came and told them, we have to raise an altar. And I've spoken to you yesterday, the purpose of all this stuff. And God started speaking, in chapter 21 of Exodus, you will see where he spoke about, he finished about altar in chapter 20 from verse 22 to the end. And in chapter 21, he began to talk about interpersonal relationship with their servants, the law concerning servants. He, he told them like in verse 2, if you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh, he shall, you, you, he shall go free and pay nothing. Now, all these people who are copying the Old Testament, why can't they copy this one? Why can't they copy all this stuff? Well, and when Jesus was true, he gave them the law concerning violence. After that, he went on, gave them the law that we can call today animal control. He gave them animal control laws. He gave them, in, in chapter 22, he began by giving them responsibility for, the, for their properties. Then the same chapter, he spoke about moral and ceremonial principles. Then in chapter 23, he spoke about justice. And now he spoke about the law of the Sabbath, why they have to rest after working for six days. And he brought in the annual feast, what we call the seven feasts of the Lord. In the same chapter 23 of Exodus, he spoke about the seven feasts of the Lord. And I've told, I mean, the three times, sorry, not the seven feasts, but the three seasons that they must assemble before God, which is, which all hold the three special times and seasons of God that has the seven special times and seasons, which we call the feasts. The seven feasts of the Lord. So Jesus began to speak and he spoke to them about the angel of his promise. He spoke to them about them serving him. He spoke to them how he's going to heal their sicknesses by then serving him. And he went on in chapter 24 and affirmed his covenant with Israel. And he went on in the same chapter. Right there while he affirmed his covenant with Israel, the Bible says the cloud of God descended. Moses gathered the 70 elders and Moses and, and Joshua stepped into the cloud and God took Moses into the deep. Because they have said he should speak to them on behalf of God. So God took him into the deep. Chapter, chapter 24 verse 18 says, So Moses went up into the midst of the cloud and went up onto the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Now here is the hypocrisy of these people. They told God, Hey, we don't want to hear from you directly. Moses, go and hear from God. Let God come and speak to us. And Moses now entered the cloud to hear from God. Only for them to now say, this Moses that brought us out of Egypt, we don't know where he has gone to. So let's make God for ourselves and go back to Egypt. How can you not know where he has gone to Why you were the one that sent him to go and look for God on your behalf? Can I tell you something? Idolatry is a product of people sending God, sending man to go and look for God on their behalf. Idolatry. When you, people have sent people to fast for them, People have sent people to pray for them. People, so, uh, they are rich guys who don't fast. They pay money to poor people to be fasting for them. So they sent Moses to go out here from God. And they went into idolatry. The idolatry in church today is because believers don't like approaching God themselves. And a failed pastor is he who has not taught his members on how to work with God on a personal level. They teach their members how to use oil, use water, how to follow shadows. Now, 
when God began to speak to Moses, the f when Moses entered the cloud and they saw him, the first thing God talked, presented to Moses is how to prepare the ark. Because they have said, they don't want God to talk to them. God now said, okay, I will still have to be speaking to you from my mercy seat. So the mercy seat in heaven, the ark in heaven, we are going to make a template here on it. So God now began to show Moses things that are in the heavens. And how he's going to duplicate them on earth so that he can be standing on those things to speak to the nation of Israel. So God began to speak to them in symbols. And all these things he was speaking to them, since they never wanted the reality, God now decided, natural Israel, you will experience the symbols. Spiritual Israel, that is the church, will experience the substance. Because I wanted you to experience the substance from the beginning. Can you imagine if Israel have experienced the substance? There will be no use of oil today. There will be no things of uh, raising of altars. All these things, prayer, clothes, uh, water, salt. It will not be used. If Israel have allowed God to manifest the substance the way he wanted. So nobody in the body of Christ will be aware of olive oil. Nobody in the body of Christ will be aware of altars will not be aware of all these things that people use in prayer will not be aware of them but because they choose symbols they choose to send Moses God now said okay natural Israel I will speak to you in symbols in type and shadows spiritual Israel I will speak to you literally we are a fortunate generation where God is speaking to us literally Drop the oil. Drop all those nonsense. Now listen carefully. When God now told Moses, collect offering from the people and use it to build a sanctuary, Exodus 25, verse 8 says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Since they don't want me to descend on the mountain, let me just reduce myself into a type and shadow, the ark. It's like, eliminating the fires and brimstone and just presenting a box as a type and shadow of my presence with you. And that was where the journey became deeper for Israel. The Bible says, Moses received all that on the mountain, the measurement for the ark, the things he's to use for the ark, and everything, the mercy seat from verse 25. And the ark is Jesus Christ. I've taught to you before, it's Jesus Christ himself. So, because Jesus is our mercy seat. So, he received all those stuff. The, the next thing he received in this chapter 20, 25 is the table of the showbread, which is in the holy place. And he received the, the uh, how to make the table of the showbread, how to make the golden lamb stand, which is also in the holy place. And Moses kept receiving all this stuff. In chapter 26, God spoke to him the totality of the tabernacle, all the measurement, all the things that had to be in the tabernacle, everything. And in chapter 27, God spoke to him about the altar of burnt offering, who later became the cross. This was the altar he told them that they have to make for him in chapter 20. An altar of earth you will make for me. That is, this is the altar. In chapter 27, he said in verse 1, you shall make an altar of acacia wood, five cubic long, and all of that stuff. So Moses received all the structure on how to make the, the altar of sacrifice, how to make the golden altar, and he, he was told how to build the outer court, then the holy place, and the most holy place. Everything continued in chapter 28. He was told how to make the priestly garment, how to make the effort, how to make the breastplate. All these things are, are the will of God concealed. And what is that will of God? Christ concealed. You see, if you, don't, if you have a pastor who have not taught you the mystery behind the tabernacle, how Christ fulfilled each part, you are missing a lot. Any Christian who don't understand the mystery of the tabernacle of Moses and how Christ fulfilled each part, you are lost. In fact, you are in the bush. You will never understand what the gospel is. You will never understand what the gospel is. Never. You will never understand what it is. So, Moses was taught, was told by God how to make the effort, how to make the breastplate, which carried the 12 tribes of Israel. And he went on and on, how to make the priestly garment. He now got to chapter 29. Remember, he has told him to collect the offerings where he will also make the anointing oil. So, me, I'm going to dwell on the, from the anointing oil now because that is where the, the contention is. 
not breastplate, not, of, not all those garments, all of that stuff. Because preachers know that that will not yield money. Those some are still doing it. So they, they don't go into, uh, we have today, we have to wear priestly garment as a symbol. We have to wear priestly garment. We have to hold effort as a symbol. It's not going to bring money to them. It will make them look like witch doctors. But the one that will silently still present them as men of God and still be bringing money is the anointing oil. And that's what we're going to look at. Now, in chapter 29, let me read chapter 30. We'll be going back and forth. Let me show you something, chapter 30. One of the, the, the verses about the anointing of that is confusing people. Go to Exodus 30, verse 31. Look at what he said. He says, and you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, this shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generation. Which, what is it that will be the holy anointing oil? Go back to verse 22. That is Exodus 30, 22. It says, I will run through it, then go back to it again to explain. It says, moreover the Lord spoke to Moses saying, also take for yourself quality spices, 500 shekels of liquid mire, if you know, if you have been to the Middle East, you will see my, my the Maya. Then, then half as much sweet-smelling cinnamon. If you go to the Middle East, even here in Kenya, there is cinnamon. It's there. Two hundred and fifty shekels. He now said two hundred and fifty shekels of sweet-smelling cane. These are spices in the Middle East. He said five hundred shekels of kashaya, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and heen of olive oil. He now said, and you shall make from this. A holy anointing oil. Now, the olive oil was different. Olive oil came from trees. So Moses carried the olive oil and mixed it with the spices under divine instruction to produce what is called the holy anointing oil. Now, listen, we are looking at Bible truth of the anointing oil. So give me your attention. Bible truth, not your pastor's truth. Not your church truth, not your bishop's truth, not your prophet's truth. We're talking about Bible truth. So let's limit ourselves to the Bible. Forget about what your bishop has taught you, what your archbishop, the way the poor people oh yeah. Forget about those nonsense. Remove those things from your mind. Let's look at the Bible. It is believers who don't read the Bible that contain with us. Let's read the Bible. Now, listen. The olive oil came from olive tree. So Moses took the olive oil from olive tree and mixed it with spices that we have mentioned and now produced what is called holy anointing oil. That means olive oil itself is not the anointing oil. Write it down. Olive oil itself. We're talking about Bible says Olive oil itself is not the anointing oil. Maybe let me clean the board so that we have some things to write. You have already understood this thing, so I can clean all of it. Olive oil itself is not the anointing oil. Write it boldly. Olive oil. That's how you see demons are manifesting. Because the spirit of lawlessness has destroyed everything. Olive oil itself is not the anointing oil. It's not. It's not. Because Moses, who was told to compose the anointing oil, the mixture of what he used to produce the holy anointing oil, the holy anointing oil. Number one, I say we limit ourselves to the Bible. Forget about the ideas of your papas. Number one, he was asked to mix a liquid spice called, forget about my pronunciation, I call it Maya. M-Y-R-R-U-H. You may know it better, no problem. He used this spice. The second spice he used is a sweet smelling cinnamon. The cinnamon tea. I used to take it. So, 
That is what Moses used. The third thing he used, 250 shekels of sweet-smelling cane. C-A-N-E. This is another spice. Now, he now, the last thing he added, according to this scripture, sorry, there's more. Five of the shekels of kashaya. These are spices. He added kashaya, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Then, he now added a heen of olive oil. Men and brethren, you that say you are using anointing oil to pray for the sick. You are using <laughs> what I will call polluted anointing oil to pray for the sick. That is why demons will be on them instead. Look at the real, any pastor who wants to pray for you with oil, ask him if it has this mixture. If he's not asking, having the mixture, push him away. Can I tell you a secret? This mixture no longer exists on earth. So if we even go to the Bible, we're not going to be using oil to pray for people. Because this mixture no longer exists. That is why the magicians now carve another word, prophetic acts. Even though I don't have olive oil, I can use palm oil. I can use a, a vegetable oil. If it is anointing oil we are talking about, you cannot use palm oil, you cannot use vegetable oil, you cannot use any oil. If it is anointing oil we are talking about, oh, if it is other oils for demonstrating magic, fine, you can use olive oil, sorry, you can use vegetable oil, palm oil, uh, even a uh, engine oil. You, 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 you can use it. If it is magic you want to play to involve demons, you can use that one. But if it is God you are dealing with, if it is God you are dealing with, you cannot use vegetable oil and call it prophetic acts. You cannot use any uh, anointing oil and call it proph prophetic. In fact, I will show you a scripture that tells us you cannot even use olive oil. You cannot even use olive oil because it can't be olive oil alone. The holy I mean holy anointing oil must be mixed with this, 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 and this. Five things. Why is it five? Five is the number of grace. That's why it is called the oil of grace. Are you understanding me? So, if we are to even you, can I, can I tell you how God saved us, we present day preachers? If God has had commanded us to use the very oil, that, this very oil, to pray for people, we will not be able because the only person that is authorized to compose this oil is Moses. So we have to go and start looking for Moses to come and mix this thing for us. Today, as we speak, the only place where this original oil of Moses is still found does not exist on the face of the earth. But the rabbis of Israel today have mixed this one by themselves. There is a group of rabbis who believe that they, they still have a remnant of the very oil that Moses uh, mixed. Do you know what they kept it? According to the story, it is hidden. Nobody even sees it. It is hidden. So if you want to use holy anointing oil, go to Israel, meet the rabbis, and ask them to give you. But they wonder your Preachers, your apostles are carrying from Jerusalem. It is not the holy anointing oil, it is olive oil from trees. And from the composition of the anointing oil, you cannot use olive oil from trees and call it anointing oil. No. If you use olive oil from trees and call it anointing oil, it is no longer holy anointing oil. It is now demonic anointing oil. That is why many have been demonized and initiated by the use of the anointing oil. All the ignorant people, open your ears and listen to me. Oh, takim, takim, takim. Open your ear and listen to me. I told you it's not a takim thing, it's a truth thing. All the kingdom seekers and Kimani followers, give me your attention now. Look at the scriptures and stop being stupid. That oil that your apostle is using to pour on the ground is olive oil. It's not a mixture of my synonym, Ken, Ken and Kashaya. It is not the holy anointing oil. It is a demonic oil because it is only olive oil. Because if it is a holy anointing oil, you don't pour it on the ground. And I will show you in scriptures. You don't put it on the ground. 
That is why what they do, they now switch and say it's a prophetic act. It's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The real symbol of the Holy Spirit was not olive oil. I will show you. The real symbol of the Holy Spirit was, a, it was a, a composition Moses made called the Holy Anointing Oil. It has a mixture of this, 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 and this. Olive oil was one of the four spices, was one of the, sorry, the o o o olive oil was used to mix the four spices to produce the Holy Anointing Oil. So any anointing oil on the face of the earth now, in any church, it's not the holy anointing oil. It's the demonic anointing oil. Any, I repeat, any anointing oil anywhere on the face of the earth today as we speak is not the holy anointing oil. Because the holy anointing oil no longer exists. It has this beautiful composition. And the only person authorized under heaven to compose it is Moses. Let me show you a place in the Bible where God warned the Israelite not to use olive oil as anointing oil. I wish that all these Christians who are arguing with me will, will follow me now. Do you think we are stupid? Do you think we just come and we're just shouting? <laughs> That's why I keep saying that many of it is when you drop, it is when you fulfill your days and step out of your body, you realize how wrong you are. Because, because of your stubbornness. Listen carefully. The fact that the person is an apostle or whatever does not make him right. If he's not following the scriptures, he's in error. There is no holy anointing oil anywhere in the world as we speak. It does not exist. It's not in Israel. It's not anywhere in the world. But what you have on earth is olive oil. That's what you have on it. And God warned the Israelite not to use the olive oil as the holy anointing oil. I will show you. So when you see somebody carrying oil in a bottle and calling it anointing oil, it is not anointing oil. Well, it could be anointing oil, but it is no holy anointing oil. It is never holy anointing oil. What makes it holy does not exist in the oil that they are using to pray for you. Now, look at the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy 20, 28. Let me show you something in the Bible. Listen. What was anointing oil used for? I mean, the holy anointing oil. I will show you later in the Bible. It was used for anointing. It was used for anointing. Now look at the instruction God gave these guys. Exodus 28 verse 40. Where God forbid the use of olive oil for anointing people. Your purpose cannot see this one. The spirit of lawlessness has blinded their eyes. So they don't see where God warned the people. Do not use olive oil to anoint yourself. Look at it in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Go to verse 40. Look at what he said. Okay, let's begin from verse 38. He said, you shall carry much seed out to the field, but gather little in. He was talking about the consequences of disobedience. He now said, for the locusts shall consume it. He said, you shall plant vineyards and tend them, but you shall neither drink of the wine nor, nor grapes, sorry, the wine nor grapes, nor gather the grapes, for the worm shall eat it. Look at verse 40. You shall have olive trees throughout all your territory. But you shall not anoint yourself with the oil, for the olives shall drop off. Now, he said you shall have the olive trees all around, but you shall not anoint yourself with the oil. There's another place in the book of Exodus, which, which I will show you, where God forbid dropping the oil on people's body. Why did he say you shall not anoint yourself? Olive oil is meant for cooking. It's very beautiful. It's also meant for rubbing on the body. That's why the word anoint in scriptures have two meanings. There is empower. There is just rubbing like cream in the body. So a, the rebellious Israel, God is saying when, when you don't obey my voice, when you start practicing instead of listening to my voice, Things will change. Even the agriculture will fail. It will fail. 
Now, if the olive leaf itself, the oil itself, God did not say shall not anoint yourself with anoint with holy anointing oil. Because I will show you what the holy anointing oil was used for. The olive trees, he said, they won't produce oil for you to use in your economic stuff. He now said, you shall not anoint your body with the oil. I mean, with the olive oil. Now, like I said, there is rubbing of the body with the oil in those days. It's like cream. But talking about the anointing to be set apart for holy, to be holy, which, which I'll show you shortly, you say you don't use the olive oil for, for all that. So, what is called a holy anointing oil is a mixture of four different, five different compositions that produce the holy anointing oil. Go back to Exodus. You will understand the, the, uh, this scripture, Deuteronomy 28, verse 40, why God made this statement when we go back to Exodus. Go to Exodus. Chapter 29. Look at chapter 29 of Exodus. The composition of the anointing oil. He now said, and you shall make for this a holy anointing oil, verse 25, an ointment compounded according to the act of the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. God was not calling the olive oil a holy anointing oil. He was calling the totality of the composition so you cannot use olive oil as an anointing oil. That is, if we are to stay under the law. If, I mean, if we are to really use the oil, as many are doing it, then you ought not to use olive oil. We ought to use the recomposition that Moses composed. Because rebellion can quench the olive trees. But this one remains because it's a symbol is a symbol. Now, let's go forward. They were, write this down if you are writing, the primary purpose of the anointing oil was to serve. The primary purpose of the holy anointing oil, I think we should add that. The primary purpose of the holy anointing oil was to serve as a symbol of setting people and object apart as holy unto the Lord. So the purpose of this was to serve as a symbol of setting people apart as holy unto the Lord. That is what it is. The primary purpose of the holy anointing oil was to serve as a symbol of setting people apart as holy unto the Lord. It wasn't to be used for, it wasn't to be used to anoint the sick so that they would be healed. It wasn't to be used, I repeat, it wasn't to be used to anoint the sick. It wasn't to be used for licking or drinking. It wasn't to be used the way they use it today and say it's, it's prophetic act. It was for setting people apart as holy unto the Lord. Number two, it is also a symbol of setting objects apart as holy unto the Lord. Number one, I say, is a symbol of setting people apart as holy unto the Lord. It's a symbol of setting objects apart. In another word, separating people and objects unto the Lord was the primary purpose of the holy anointing oil. I repeat, no preacher on earth today is in possession of the holy anointing oil. All of them are carrying olive oil, some vegetable oils, few others. Engine oil, the way they tell people to. Me, I've used engine oil. Where there was no anointing, we use engine oil. And we call it prophetic act. Symbol of the Holy Spirit. Wait for tomorrow. Now listen carefully. 
Don't forget this statement. There is no preacher on earth today who is in possession of the holy anointing oil. I mean, the composition called the holy anointing. There's no preacher on earth. So only any oil they're using on you is fake. It's not even the holy anointing oil. It's fake. That is why you are at risk using the oil. Do you know that they will keep you ignorant of these things? Because a lot of preachers, I, I told you there's a preacher that made 100 million from oil in, two, in, two, in I mean 2001, 21 years ago, 100 million. Now they are making billions from the oil. They can't stop using it because of the money it's bringing. It is you that should warn yourself and say, hey, since there is no holy anointing oil again on the face of the earth, I should not subject myself to any oil. Are you understanding me? I repeat, there is no preacher on earth today who is in possession of the holy anointing oil. They are only in possession of olive oil. Can I tell you a secret? Do you know why God made sure that there is no holy anointing oil anywhere on the face of the earth now? Except those who claim they have it, the, the rabbis, the present day rabbis. Do you know why also you cannot trace the ark? What you, you cannot trace the ark. You cannot trace the anointing oil that was composed by Moses. You cannot trace the rod of Aaron. You cannot trace the golden manna, I mean the manna that was kept in the ark. You cannot trace the golden pot of manna. You cannot trace those. You know why? Because they have been fulfilled in Christ. God makes sure that they are buried in history. They cannot be found. The ark you have today is, is fake one. It wasn't the one that Moses made. It's man-made fake ark. That's what you find today. Do you know why God made sure that the original ark that Moses made, the original rod of Aaron, the original golden pot of manna, the original olive oil no longer exists because the ark was fulfilled in Christ. The olive oil is the Holy Spirit today. The holy anointing is the Holy Spirit today. So instead of preachers to tell you the truth, that we are no longer in possession of the holy anointing oil, they go to carry olive oil and call it anointing oil. And they will say, whatever thing you say, it becomes is a lie. Fake. Every preacher using oil today is using fake oil. And they deceive you and call it anointing oil. Is anointing oil actually, because the word anointing is not a monopoly of the church. It is anointing oil, but not a holy anointing oil. It is most, it's actually demonic anointing oil. That's what it is. It's demonic anointing oil. It does not exist anyway. This composition had disappeared. God made sure it happened. You know why? Because the substance has arrived. So the shadow must disappear. Anytime substance arrives, shadows don't remain. Pastors are the ones that will go, and, will go and manufacture the shadows and begin to use it on people. So, the primary purpose of the holy anointing oil was to serve as a symbol for setting people and objects apart as holy unto the Lord. As holy unto the Lord. Now, the word holy means separated for the Lord's use. Separated for the Lord's use and I'm going to drop some things in your spirit from this. I mean, we'll, we'll look at certain scriptures so that in this generation where people seem not to have respect for carriers of the re-anointing, re-holy anointing oil, which is not in a bottle, which is in the spirit of man, which the Holy Ghost give, it's because they don't understand some of these things. And you know that your life, if you don't respect the anointing of the Holy Spirit, your life will be a misery on earth. If you keep holding the olive oil, you will know when you have touched the demonic. So let's go further. I said the primary purpose of the holy anointing oil was to serve as a symbol of setting people and objects apart as holy unto the Lord. In another word, when God wants to set you in the days of the Bible under Moses, when God wants to set you apart 
as holy unto him. He will ask Moses or the priest or anyone to carry that oil that Moses composed and pour it on your head. Once it has touched your head, the Spirit of God may rest upon you. From that time, people have to start treating you differently. Nobody talks to you anyhow, or else God judge them. People must start treating you differently because you have been set aside for God's use. God will be judging those that treat you wrongly. That's the meaning of touch not my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. Are you understanding me? So because of that, what was happening in Israel, let's begin with the examples of objects that were set aside for God's use, using the holy anointing oil. Today, you see people building churches, and they say we are dedicating the building, and they start pouring oil <laughs> in it. They are pouring olive oil in it. They are not pouring, pouring the holy anointing oil. Before you know, demonic things are already happening in that church. Because what they are pouring is not the holy anointing oil. It's just olive oil. Because the holy anointing oil does not exist again. And you think that it is now holy because one pastor is holding it. No, it's lawlessness. God can no longer make any oil holy because the days of oil are over. Every oil you see today is either demonic or polluted. It's not holy. I repeat, God cannot make any oil holy. They, can I tell you a secret? The fact that men of God are laying hand on you and praying does not mean that God himself is laying hand on you. Preachers could hold something and declare it holy, and God did not declare it holy. And you believe it's not holy because it's a pre preacher you respect that has called it holy. I repeat, in this dispensation, God will never make any oil holy. Because the only oil that was made holy was the one that Moses composed. And after that, I will show you in the Bible where God warned that nobody should do it again. Maybe I should show you that now. Go to the same Exodus that we're reading. The Bible says in verse 31, And you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing of to me throughout your generations. This, 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 the very one that Moses composed, that's what he's referring to. It shall be there. It is this scripture that makes me believe that maybe people that say that the, the rabbis still have a little portion of what Moses composed hidden. It could be true because the Bible says it shall be holy anointing on to me throughout your generations. Now listen, in that generation, it shall be as a literal mixture and composition of what Moses did in our own generation. It's going to be the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon us. But fulfilling the same purpose, having the same spirit, this, I told you before, spirit, intent, and purpose cannot change. Under Moses, it was a substance mixed with Maya, cinnamon, cinnamon, cane, cashier, and olive oil. In our generation, it is the Holy Spirit resting upon us. I wish I have time to demystify each of these, and you will see the five basic works of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Are you understanding me? Now listen carefully. There are many other works of the Holy Spirit. There are five basics. Now listen carefully. Listen carefully. Now, if you look at it, the spirit and the intent and purpose remain the same, but the mixture have changed. The method have changed. In the days of Moses, the method was a physical substance composed by Moses. In our days, it is now the Holy Spirit himself resting upon us, but he is still the holy anointing oil in our generation just as he was in their generation as a symbol. So that scripture still stands when he said, this shall be a holy anointing to me throughout your generations. It will be holy to the Lord that anybody that mixture touches will be set aside for God's use. That is why even today, when the Holy Ghost come upon you, you are declared holy before God. You have been set aside for God's use. That was why God told the disciples, don't go to preach yet until you go to the upper room so that my spirit can come upon you. As soon as my spirit come upon you, you have been set apart for my use. You cannot go and preach the gospel. Are you understanding me? That is why the baptism of the Holy Spirit is very important. Holy Ghost baptism is you being set aside for God's use. Just as the olive oil 
the, sorry, the holy anointing oil was being used in the days of Moses to set objects and people apart for God's use. That now means today you don't set a building for God's use by using olive oil. As soon as the money that was used to build the house came to come, sorry, if the money that was used to build the house came through sanctified means, the house is already set aside for God's use. It's holy unto the Lord. It's already holy. Let me show you something. But let's go back to the days of Moses. The Bible says that, listen, oh God help us. The Bible says, it shall not be poured on man's flesh. Do you see what I say? You don't even pour the real holy anointing on here. You don't pour it on people's flesh. You don't pour it on people. They real, but this one that they are pouring on you is olive oil. It's not the holy one. It's not the holy one. It's the polluted one. It's the perverted one. It's the adulterated one. It's not the holy one. The holy one ended with Moses. And that holy one has instruction. Don't pour it on people's body. That I will show you why James said, anoint them with oil. We'll, we'll come to that. Now listen. It says, it shall not be poured on man's flesh, nor shall you make any other like it. Do you see it? According to its composition. So when any preacher gets up today, let's assume they even go and start looking for uh, these, these spices in the Middle East and mix it with olive oil and use it to pray for you. They have broken the scriptures because the Bible says it, shall not be, it should not be made again. Made again. Only the one Moses made is valid before God. Another meaning of this shall be holy unto me. Look at what God says. This shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generation. That means the only oil I will recognize is the one I asked Moses to make. Is the holy anointing oil that I asked Moses to make. In every generation, that is the one I will recognize. Don't you think God for new? that our generation will have mad pastors that will be carrying oil everywhere and pouring everywhere they go. That is why he said, the holy anointing oil that Moses made shall be holy unto me. That means shall be set apart for my use throughout all generations. As then, nobody else should compose any other one. Because only the one that Moses composed will be recognized before me. Foolish Christian, how do you think that that anointing oil your pastor is using recognized before God? Why the Bible is saying it is not recognized? Your pastor and the Bible, who is more correct? Before he starts shouting, talking, talking, your pastor and the Bible, who is correct? The Bible is saying that only the holy anointing oil that Moses composed is will be holy before God throughout all generations, including our own generation. That means the one your pastor is composing is not recognized by God and you're allowing him to pour it on your head, to use it to anoint your shop, to use it to anoint your children, to use it to pour everywhere. You are very stupid because, because you don't read the Bible. Because, you, see, you see the way we have exposed ourselves to destruction because we don't read the Bible. Because we don't read the Bible, we just expose ourselves to destruction. Look at, let, look at it again. We're looking at Bible truth. Bible truth of the anointing oil. That's what we're looking at. Look at this again. Let me, let me read that scripture again. He said, and you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, this shall be a holy anointing oil. This one you have composed now. Shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. Which people? Talking about the generation of the Jews anyway, not even us, the Gentiles. But for purpose of people that don't want to reason, that's why I am saying including our generation. Ordinary ought to be generation of the Jews, not also. We will have Holy Ghost as our own Holy Anointing Oil, not the one that Moses composed. And God is now saying, the one that Moses composed is the only one I will recognize in every generation. God foreknew that there will be some crazy pastors in our generation that will be using olive oil. And God is saying, I will not recognize the use of olive oil by your pastors. 
That's what the Bible is saying. And yet, you recognize. Can I tell you why the demonic is not manifesting through the anointing or yet? Because the pastors have broken the scriptures. Whenever you do something standing on a broken strip scripture, the demonic express itself. They call it prophetic acts. How can you call something that does not align with God's will prophetic acts? You don't really know what is prophetic act. That's why I call it magical act. Prophetic witchcraft. Wait for tomorrow when we define prophetic acts. You understand? Listen, God has said, the one Moses composed is the only one I recognize. Anyone in the hand of your apostles, your bishops, I don't recognize it. The bishop may recognize it. You may recognize it, but I don't recognize it. That is how all of you are in lawlessness. Recognizing what God does not recognize. Look at the next statement he made. It shall not be poured on man's flesh. The holy anointing oil that Moses composed shall not be poured on man's flesh. That means this one that they are pouring on people's flesh, where did it come from? It is not the holy anointing oil that Moses composed. If it is the anointing oil we are talking about now, it's a polluted, adulterated oil that your pastor composed. It shall not be poured on man's flesh, nor shall you make any other like it. That means you shall not counterfeit it. You should not duplicate it. What we have today is the counterfeit holy anointing oil. Every anointing oil in a bottle, every anointing oil in a horn today, even if they travel to Israel to go and carry it, they are bringing olive oil for you. And once they bring it, the Bible says it's counterfeit. It is fake. They are impostors. Even under Moses alone, they are impostors. The cost of doing the work of God deceitfully will speak in their lives. I mean, under Moses alone, not even under Christ, that, that, that we don't even need it again. It says, It shall not be poured on man's flesh, nor shall you make any other like it, according to its composition. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. This one is set apart. The one Moses composed. He said, whoever composed any like it, or whoever puts any of it on an outsider, outsider shall be cut off from his people. What's the meaning of cut off? A lot of believers have been cut off from the real body of Christ through the use of oil. They have been cut off from the real body of Christ through the use of oil. That's how you see what should not happen to Christ is happening to them. What, should not hap what cannot happen to Christ is happening to them. They are oppressed by witches. They are living in sin. They are involved in wickedness because they have been disconnected from the body of Christ. So the causes of their father's house is working in their life because they have been disconnected from the body of Christ. They allow the users of oil to disconnect them. Look at the judgment God put. God said anyone who compose anything that looks like it, anyone who drop it in people's body, anyone who fake it, shall be cut off from the family of God. So the covenant of the family of God will not work. Why is it that we have so many curses today? Look at, look at, look at Christians. They have to go and run to this mountain, run to the mountain, go and, because, because they are not connected to the body of Christ. The power of the cross that crushes curses, that silences altars, evil altars, is not at work in their lives. Because they have been cut off from the body. They are not part of the body of Christ. The use of oil is so dangerous that many don't realize. Let me take you to another point. So, in the days of the Bible, this very oil that Moses composed was used to anoint objects, to set those objects apart for God. For instance, in the days of Moses, let's say they want to use this uh, uh, um, pulpit. They will first of all anoint it with the oil that Moses composed. Because by pouring that symbol of the Holy Spirit on it, you have declared the pulpit sanctified for God's use. So nobody else will use it. If they want to give a house to God, they will anoint it. And the only house that was anointed was the tabernacle. Not the houses that the people where people are living. Today they anoint everywhere. Anoint your house. Look at the error. You anoint house 
and still use fake anointing oil to anoint the house. If you really want to anoint the house, travel to Israel, meet the, the, the rabbis and beg them to give you a little that Moses composed. Even that one will bring the demonic because the days of that one is over. Are, are over. You see, the Bible is so sweet. It's just that we don't, we don't read it. It's so clear. Now, here's an example where objects were anointed. The same chapter, let's go to chapter 40 of Exodus. Chapter 40. Exodus chapter 40, verse 9. Look at what it says. And you shall take the anointing oil, the holy anointing oil that Moses composed. You shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it. Today, they use olive oil and anoint buildings, church buildings. Anoint the seat. Anoint, anoint the seat that people come and sit. That is charismatic witchcraft. Anoint everywhere, and what they are even using is not even the holy anointing oil, it's just olive oil that is not recognized before God as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The only oil God recognized as a symbol of the Holy Spirit is the one that Moses composed, not the one that your apostle went to Israel and bought. That one is olive oil, it's not recognized before God as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The only one recognized is the olive oil that Moses, sorry, the holy anointed oil that Moses composed. And now that the Holy Spirit has come, that one is no longer recognized before God. If it was recognized, God would have given it to all of us to be using. Instead of the Holy Ghost being everywhere, that holy anointing oil will be everywhere. But why is it that God makes sure it is nowhere? Because the real one has come. So the one your pastor is holding is fake. It's just olive oil. At most, they go to Israel and pick it and come. It is fake. It is not a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It's a symbol of their stupidity. That's what it is. It is a symbol of their stupidity. It's not a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Every Christian using oil as a symbol of the Holy Spirit has been deceived and derailed by their preachers. The only oil recognized as a symbol of the Holy Spirit was the holy anointing that God told Moses to compose. And when the Holy Spirit was poured, that was dismissed in the courts of heaven. No oil on earth. No olive oil on earth. If you like, take it from Israel. No oil on earth is recognized by God as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. That is why any Holy Spirit that asks you to use oil as a symbol is not the Holy Spirit of God is other spirits, mostly religious spirit, is the one speaking to your apostles and your prophets. Let's go further. The Bible says, And you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it, and you shall hallow it and all its utensils, and it shall be holy. That means in the tabernacle of, of meeting, the anointed, the utensils that were used. They anointed everything that was used. Look at verse 10. You shall anoint the altar. They also anointed the altar of the burnt offering and all its utensils and consecrate the altar. The altar shall be most holy. So you see where they were anointing objects to set them apart for God's use. You have seen pastors carry oil over oil to go and pour on the stage they call altar because they read the scripture. We call it double wahala. Double wahala. Do you know why it's double wahala? Double trouble. You know why? Because the oil itself is fake. And you pouring it on the altar is false. So you are using a fake thing to do a false thing. It is called double wahala for the whole church. You are using a fake holy anointing oil to do a fake thing. Because the real altar is not where the pastor is standing to preach. I've told you what altars are yesterday and two days ago. The real altar is not where the pastor is standing to preach, my friend. He said, you shall anoint the altar of the bond of and all his utensils, 
and you, verse 11, and you shall anoint the lava and its base and consecrate it. Mind you, they never used this olive oil to anoint where the Israelites were living. Because the purpose was not to anoint our dwelling places. So today when you carry the olive oil to go and anoint your house, to go and anoint this, you are practicing lawlessness. You are using a fake holy anointing oil and doing a false thing all at the same time. You are walking in falsehood. You open a shop. Oh, they come and anoint your shop. You are stupid. Because even the oil they are coming with is fake. It's not the holy anointing oil that represents the Holy Spirit. They are bringing a fake one. So the pastor is bringing a fake oil to do a false thing. Because the oil was not originally used to anoint shops. It wasn't used to anoint business places. That is how you introduce yourself to the spirit. Or you introduce the spirit of lawlessness into, into, into your life. Because you are looking for miracles. That is why any miracle that happens is magic. It's magic. Holy anointing oil. The only miracle it performed was to set the people apart or the object apart for God's use. That was why when Nebuchadnezzar's son took the vessels and was drinking with them, God judged him and brought his kingdom to an end because those vessels had been anointed with the holy anointing oil that Moses composed. Can I shock you? Go and read the life of Jezebel. The dogs, when the dogs ate Jezebel, the dogs never ate the part of her body that they used that oil of Moses to anoint her with. That is the miracle of that holy anointing oil. God was doing that to show the divinity in that thing. Are you understanding me? So it wasn't used to anoint, it, it wasn't used to make businesses prosper. The key to make business prosper is in Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is he that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the ways of sinners, nor sit in the seat of their comforts. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in his season. And whatever he does shall prosper. That is the key to prospering business. He's not carrying olive oil and pouring it in your shop. You guys are provoking magic. You are provoking sorcery. And by the time sorcery gives you one or two miracles, it will come back to eat the business and ground you down economically. And they'll begin to blame it on evil altar in your village. The pastors have confused people so much these days. There's a lot of confusion. Turning people around like, like, a, like a whatever. That's why the judgment they will be terrible. Can you imagine? Those of you who say, why do you say Kimani did not, uh, did not hear from God? You cannot see in the Bible that he did not hear from God. That you use oil and pour in the 14, 47 countries. He didn't hear from God. The true God will never ask him to do that. Because the oil they are using is fake. If God wanted him to do it, God would tell him, go to Israel. Go, to, go and meet the rabbis and carry the oil of Moses. Which does not exist because people are arguing. Nobody has, those who wrote that it is there have not even seen it. And the God I know who wiped away the ark will not allow that oil to be seen so that people will not pursue the shadow. They will wait for the substance. Can I tell you something? The disciples would not have waited in the upper room if they know that that oil is valid. They would have gone to meet the rabbis and collect the oil instead. If you understand the Bible, you can tell when a preacher did not hear from God. If you understand this book, you can tell when a preacher did not hear from God. They have misled people for generations. I told you when I was studying the Bible 12 hours a day, I wept for the church. I saw the lies I have believed. That's why I gathered all the books I bought from winners and everywhere. And I gathered everything, the tapes, and I burned them. Because they were different from what the Bible is saying to me. I mean, no interpretation. You don't read the Bible literal. You see the lies they have been telling I gathered everything and I burnt them. That was in 1999. Everything I burnt them. I said, no, I cannot keep this. So, you can read of other places where they anointed vessels in the temple. They anointed a whole lot of stuff. They never anointed people's businesses. It's the spirit of lawlessness that tells a pastor to carry the fake olive oil 
and go and pour it on your business. The spirit of lawlessness will tell the pastor to carry the fake one and pour it on your head and call it ordination. That's how they put demons on your head. Now, listen. This holy anointing oil composed by Moses will symbolize the Holy Spirit. Not olive oil. Not Look at the composition. Olive oil is just one of it. Not olive oil. The entire composition is what represents the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of grace. Five is the number of grace. So the entire composition is what represents the Holy Spirit. Not olive oil, though. The way your pastors are deceiving you. Now listen to this. Listen to this. We have seen how this holy anointing oil was used to anoint objects. We didn't see where they use it to anoint people's houses where they live. We didn't see where they use it to anoint people's cars. Apostle, there were no cars in the Old Testament. There were chariots. Chariots represent cars. I didn't see where they carry olive oil. This Moses oil, an anoint chariot. Let's say they anointed chariots. Okay, let's anoint cars. I didn't see what they anoint even clothes. The Bible said they didn't even pour it on people's body. You using it to pray for the sick because of James chapter 5 and Mark chapter 6. Open your ear and listen to me. They didn't use this to pour. In fact, God instruct them. Don't pour it on people's skin. He even said, don't put it to an outsider. That means a non-Jew should not receive the anointing oil. Let's assume that we have this holy anointing oil. You don't use it on unbelievers. You don't use it on people who are not working in the ways of God. You know why? Because the Holy Ghost is for those who have embraced Christ. Because the holy anointing oil was not for, for outsiders. So the Holy Ghost is not for outsiders. Jesus, came to, Jesus spoke it when he said, this, the, that, that, that the people of this world cannot receive the spirit of God. Because in the days of the Bible, the holy anointing oil was not used on outsiders. So the people of this world can never receive the spirit of God. They can never receive the spirit of God in their life. The people of this world, they can't receive it. In the same way, the holy anointing oil was, was God, God gave Moses the instruction, don't put it on outsiders. Because when the Holy Ghost finally come, the people of this world will not be able to receive him until they come into Christ. Now, your pastor who is using oil, why is he not obeying all these things? Number one, he should not use olive oil. It's fake. Number two, if, if you want to use oil, you should go to Israel and meet the rabbis, which it does not even exist because it's been long. It's, it's over 6,000 years. So that oil will not even be there. Do you know what happened? Go, go and read the history of the Jews. Even before Jesus come, I don't think that oil was there in the temple. Okay, let's assume it was there. Forty years after Jesus left, the Roman came and destroyed the entire Jerusalem. Do you know that there was a season where there's this empire called Ottoman Empire. They ruled in Jerusalem for over, is it oh, how many years? Hundreds of years. Do you think they will leave those olive oil there? God even when Nebuchadnezzar came to carry Israel into captivity, do you think they, he left the oil there? Israel have gone into captivity twice. Do you think they left the oil there? The, for 70 years, nobody was in Israel. Do you think the oil of Moses is there? So even if you go to Israel today and they say this is the oil, it's a lie because historic events have taken away the oil from the temple. That's how today nobody can tell where the ark is. So the holy anointing oil that Moses composed does not exist on the face of the earth. So you cannot be using olive oil the way the holy anointing oil was used. You are fake. You are being ruled by the spirit of lawlessness because this was used to announce the arrival of the Holy Ghost. Give me your attention. Give me your attention. So, objects were anointed with this to set them apart for God's use. Those objects that were anointed, if you check all the objects and you look at them in the eyes of the New Testament, you will understand that it was referring to you and I. The altar is our heart. So God was simply saying, anoint the spirits of the people with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. That is Holy Ghost baptism. The vessels they anointed in the temple represented you and I in the house of God. If the Holy Ghost comes, his attention is not on the building, it's on the people. That is why church is not a building. Church is a people. I repeat, when the Holy Ghost comes to church today, it's not, his interest will not be the building, it's the people. 
But do you know why this preacher still use the oil? Is is to create something in your psyche. So you see them as holy men of God. It's just it's just to create a a, a psyche. It, it, to me, they are just building a paradigm, a stronghold in you, for you to keep respecting them and worshiping them as deities. I repeat, let them throw away the oil. Their ministry will fold up in six months. Let every user of oil throw away the oil. Their ministry will fold up in six months. Many of them will be exposed as God did not call them or, they are, or God called them and God have abandoned them. But now they're using the oil, the use of oil to cover their nakedness. Why is it that they are fighting to keep using the oil, to keep raising the altar? Because that is the only way they can cover their nakedness. Let them drop the oil. Then we will know if God called them or not. And you will submit in your head for that fake thing to be poured on it. <laughs> no wonder there's no Christ in your character. No wonder demons are everywhere making life unbearable for you. Listen carefully. So let's go to the next verses. Verse 12. In verse 9 to 11, he anointed object. Verse 12. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and wash them with water. Now, all this, this is ordination. This was ordination <laughs> under the law. Since you want to use oil to pour on the people, bishop, Ask Bishop, listen to me. Since you want to use oil to pour on people to ordain them, please, Moses never began with oil. He began by beating them with water. He washed them. So what you're supposed to do is this. You're supposed to carry buckets of water and come to church. I mean, the pastors you want to ordain to ministry, they carry buckets of water and come to church. And they all need that. And you pour it on them first before you pour oil on them. That if you want to do it the way it's supposed to, it's supposed to be, because that was what Moses did. He said, bring them to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. The door, not even inside the church. So what you're supposed to do, you call the pastors out, you take them at the door. And everybody stand in the door. Then you pour them water. After pouring them water, you now pour them oil. But today, do you know what they do? They just pour the oil. That tells you it is lawlessness. It's not Christ. Christ is not the one ruling these guys. It's lawlessness. It's the antichrist. Antichrist is the one pouring oil on people today, not Christ. Christ will never tell you to pour oil on people. Antichrist will tell you to pour oil on people. He will tell you to give them to drink. And you, you, you will call it prophetic acts. Tomorrow you will see prophetic acts. Whenever genuine prophetic acts are unfolded, power break out. So we have moved to the point of anointing persons now. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and wash them with water. <laughs> you shall put the holy garments on Aaron after you've bathed them. You now pour them the ordination gown. <laughs> and anoint him and consecrate him that he may minister to me as priest. And you shall bring his sons and clothe them with tonics. You shall anoint them as you anointed their father. That they may minister to me as priests, for their for their their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Look at that word, their generation, not not our their. That is what they are calling timeless timeless ordinance. It doesn't belong to us. Okay, God. Now listen. There's no time for me to dig certain apostolic truth from. The statement that says, as you anointed their father. But let me tell you this. Do you know why we have spiritual fathers? God will anoint you the way he anointed your father. That's why it's good to sit down and understand your, understand your spiritual father, how he's working with God. Because God will only anoint you the way he anointed him. The way he means footsteps. The price the man paid. Or the, the price he paid to work with God. The fast things. The, the, the roots he followed. The consecration. The commitment. Are you understanding me? The Bible said that is the way God will anoint you. That means the way he worked with God and end the anointing. You also to work with God and end your own anointing. You don't carry. I repeat. The way he worked with God to end the anointing. You also to work with God to end the anointing. You don't go and push it and say give me your own anointing. Because generations are not the same. Before you end up 
getting anointing of the anointed cherub, thinking that you got your father's anointing. Fathers have used it. There's a difference between mantle and anointing. There's a difference between mantle and anointing. The mantle that fell, it was the mantle that fell on Elisha, not the anointing of Elijah that fell on Elisha. It, it was the double portion of the spirit, not double portion of the anointing. Listen. There's a difference between the mantle and the anointing. Different between the spirit. The spirit is the content. Sorry, the container. The mantle is the assignment. It's the grace. The assignment. The burden of the Lord. That was in the Father, was dropped down in the Son. Now listen carefully. He said, you shall anoint them. So if you look at this scripture, we can see one, the primary purpose of the anointing of the holy anointing oil was to serve as a symbol of the Holy Spirit, setting people apart as holy unto the Lord for God's use, setting objects apart for God's use. So the people, number one, we have seen priests. Two, kings also were set apart. Later on in the years, the same anointing composed by Moses was kept under the custody of the prophets. And they were using it to anoint kings. That is why anybody who had been recognized to be a prophet, that the priests who allowed the person to be in possession of that anointing oil. Let, let me tell you one of the major assignments of Aaron. It was to protect that anointing oil that Moses composed. Remember Moses was a prophet. So the prophetic was used by God to compose the holy anointing oil now and it was kept in custody of the priest so when that generation went subsequent generation the priest of every generation was protecting that holy anointing that moses composed until he got to the next prophet after moses which was samuel and samuel who laid hold look at what the bible says as soon as it became clear to all israel that samuel had been established to be a prophet he gained access to the oil that Moses composed. That was why when God wanted to anoint Saul king, anoint means he wanted to declare him holy for his use, God had to order the steps of Saul to meet Samuel. And in 1 Samuel chapter 10, Samuel poured that very oil that Moses composed upon Saul. So that it will be clear to Saul that you have been set apart for God's use. It's a message in the realm of the spirit that Saul has been set apart for God's use. So demons, stay clear. So the devil begin to stay clear because there's a law. Touch not my anointed ones. Touch not the one that the holy anointing oil have been poured upon to be set apart for God's use. Touch them not. Do them no harm. Respect them. Honor them. So that was what happened to Saul. And the Spirit of God even came upon him much later and he began to prophesy. Now, it, when Saul was rejected, look at what God did. God told Samuel again, fill your horn with oil. Which oil? Composed by Moses. Because the Holy Ghost has not been given. So we have to keep using the symbol. Now, take it and go to the house of David. I have chosen one of them to be, to be king in place of Saul. And when Samuel got there, you know all the story. He wanted to pour the oil on the wrong person. If he had done it, God would have no choice but to use Eliab, even though he does not like him. Because whoever carries that holy anointing oil will be set apart for God's use. God, God will have ended up. That was why God guided Samuel. I have not chosen him. Don't pour it on him. I have not chosen him. You pour only on him that I have chosen. And at the end of the day, it was poured on David. The Bible says, as soon as the holy anointing oil that Moses composed came upon David, the spirit of God left Saul and came to David. Now listen carefully. The spirit of God always rests on people that the holy anointing oil that Moses composed is poured upon. It was not poured on their body. It was poured on their head. You know why? Because when the re-anointing oil will come, which is the Holy Spirit, is going to descend on the head of the people like tongues of fire. Acts chapter 2. They didn't pour it on the kings on their body. They didn't pour it on the priests on their body. They poured it on their head. 
because there's going to be a generation that will be made kings and priests unto God. And they will be in the upper room waiting for the real one to come. And it's going to come and descend on their heads, not on their legs. Today, pastors are not feet and not fingers and not everything. You know why they are doing it successfully? Because it is not the holy anointing. Here. Can I tell you a secret? If it was the holy anointing, if it is the holy anointing that Moses composed, that a pastor is misusing like that, they will have died instantly. They will, remember, under Moses, God was killing instantly. They will have died instantly. But you know why they are not dying? Because it's fake. It's a fake oil they are using on people. It's a fake one. They are the one calling it powerful. They are the one giving, calling it. Uh, is a fake one. And Nehushtan will manifest one or two, three times and give you miracles. It's a fake one. Now listen carefully. Kings were anointed. You see, during that dispensation, God began to clear the air. Even before the cross, using certain Bible characters to show that the days of the holy anointing on earth will soon be over. It's going to usher in the real world, which is the Holy Spirit. That is why you see, whoever they anoint, anoint, the Holy Spirit come upon. To show us that time is going to come, that you don't need to anoint, the Holy Ghost will come. So, God was posting his spirit side by side, the Holy Anointing oil of Moses, to tell the people that there is a genuine one. This one you are using is a shadow. There is a substance that is coming. So that was why when the Holy Anointing oil was poured on David, the Spirit of God came upon David to show that generation that the Holy Anointing oil is a type and shadow of the Spirit of God. So a time is going to come that the shadow will go away when the substance appears. I think David even understood it more than many pastors today. When you hear David saying, that anointed my cup with oil, my head with oil and my cup run over. Do you think it was the oil that somewhere poured on him? No, it was the Holy Spirit. David interacted with the Spirit of God. He enjoyed the, the best of the Spirit in his days. And now God began to use certain Bible characters to show us that our to show us to show to that generation that a generation is going to arise that will that the substance will sit on, not the shadow. One of the characters God used was Elijah. Show me in the Bible where they pour oil on Elijah for him to, to, be, to become a prophet. There is no prophet in the Bible that was ordained to be a prophet with the oil. Go and read the Bible. No one. It was the priest that was that way anointed with oil to be priests. Kings were anointed to be kings. But no one anointed the prophets. That is God's saying. The church, which is a prophetic entity, will not carry the oil of Moses on their head. We will carry the Holy Spirit upon our lives. When God told Elijah, go and anoint Elijah to be prophet in your room. Go and search out the Bible. Show me where Elijah poured oil on Elisha. In the, in the, in the, I mean, you can't find. When God said anoint Azahir to be king, Anoint Jehu to be king over Israel. Jehu was the only one that was anointed with the olive oil. Sorry, with the holy oil, not olive oil. Holy anointing oil. Look at it in 2 Kings chapter 9. 2 Kings chapter 9. Verse 1, And Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Get yourself ready, take these flags of oil in your hand, and go to Ramoth Gilead. Now when you arrive at that place, look there for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and make him rise up from among his associates, and take him to, the, to an inner room. Then take the flags of oil and pour it on his head, and say, Thus says the Lord, I've anointed you king over Israel. They open the door and flee and do not delay. Jehu was poured that oil. Behazahil was not. Go back. <laughs> Go back to chapter 8. Hazahil was not. And yet the spirit came upon them. Look at what the Bible says. They became king. 
Hazael was not, he wasn't trained. When a preacher is called and not trained, his ministry will be full of some calamities. Pe people cannot be made temples for God in the spirit. That was what happened to Hazael. He wasn't trained, but he received the spirit, the call of God. The spirit of God manifested that in his life to go into ministry. And he went, but he was not trained. His lack of training now resulted in what Elisha said. Look at 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 7. Then Elisha went to Damascus, and ben -Hadda, king of Syria, was sick. And it was told him, saying, The man of God has come here. And the king said to Hazael, Take a present in your hand, and go to meet the man of God. And inquire of the Lord to him, saying, Shall I recover from this disease? This was Old Testament practices. Not for the new. New, freely receive, freely give. So Hazael went to meet him and took a present with him of every good thing of Damascus, 40 camel loads. And he came and stood before him and said, Your son ben Hadda, king of Syria, has sent me to you, saying, Shall I recover from this disease? And Elisha said to him, Go, say to him, You shall certainly recover. However, the Lord has shown me that he will really die. Then he set his countenance in a stare until he was ashamed. And the man of God wept. And Hazael said, Why is my Lord weeping? He answered, because I know the evil. Do you see it? The evil that you will do to the children of Israel. Called but not trained. When a preacher is called but not trained, his ministry will do evil to the children of Israel. Will do evil to the people of God. That's why you see the bad things I have heard from all these apostles. What people, the evil their ministries have done to Christians in Kenya. You'll be shocked. Because they were not trained. Called but not trained. You'll be doing ministry, you will think that you are doing a good thing. But whatever you are doing is doing evil to the children of Israel. You know children of Israel, they born again. They're those who are seeking the Lord. Your ministry will be doing evil to them. Because you, because you are not trained. Do you know the evil? We bring the demonic upon them. Do you know how many people have met who have raised altars and done all this nonsense they have been told to do, how they have struggled with demons. Look at the woman who testified on Sunday, how her mother died when they raised an altar. Pastors that are called but not trained will bring the sword of death to your life if you allow them to minister to you. They will ruin you. So he told him, because of the evil you will do to the children of Israel, there are strongholds you will set on fire. I wish I have time to teach this. Do you know how many strongholds of believers that have been set on the fire of hell by these pastors that are not trained? Believers can no longer pray. They only download prayers from the internet. They follow what the Papa is saying. They don't have the prayer mantle. Their stronghold is broken. They cannot sit down and study the Bible. They don't know the word. They don't know God for themselves. Their stronghold is broken by the fire of hell. Preachers, Hazael represent Preachers that are called but not trained. That will blow the stronghold of God's people. Introduce them to another prayer movement. Introduce them to another spirit. And they will not have intimacy with the true Jesus Christ. He says, there are stronghold you will set on fire. And there are young men you will kill with the sword. Do you know how many youths have been destroyed? The life of youth have been destroyed completely by this perversion in the church. Completely destroyed. He said, and you will dash their children, their visions, the things God has called them to do. You will dash it and rip up their women with child. This, you see, I'm reading this thing with the eyes of the, of the New Testament. Those who are pregnant by the Lord with amazing visions, they will rip it up and pollute it. So as I said, but what is your servant, a dog? That you should do this gross thing. And Elijah answered, The Lord has shown me that you will become king over Israel. And he departed from Elisha and came to his master. Of course, he became king finally. So you didn't see Elijah pouring oil on him. But these are pointers. God was showing that generation. There's going to be a generation that will not use the holy anointing oil of Moses, they will use the Holy Spirit upon their lives. And with that, they will carry out great exploit for God. So, the primary purpose of the holy anointing oil that Moses composed was for setting, was to serve as a symbol for setting people and objects apart for holy use. Now, number two, write this down. 
it was forbidden to be used on outsiders. I've explained this. It was forbidden to be used on outsiders or the body of an uncommon man. <laughs> Richard. It was forbidden to be used on outsiders or the body of an uncommon man. In another word, uncommon today is people who have no value for God. And I've explained what outsiders are. So look at what the Bible says. Sorry, another thing I wanted to write is this. Number three, Judaism extended the use of the holy oil to the sick. Judaism extended the use of the, of the holy oil to the sick because of the spiritual effect it created under the law. Judaism extended the use of the holy oil to the sick because of the spiritual effect it created under the law. Get that before I explain something to you. Judaism extended, it, extended the use of the holy oil to the sick because of the spiritual effect it created under the law. Now, can I tell you a secret? The genuine holy anointing oil, you know, I know, cannot survive even to the days of Christ. Now, which oil now do you think Judaism were now using to anoint the sick? Open your ears and listen to me. Which oil do you think Judaism was now using to anoint the sick? Which oil? It is the olive oil, the fake one. Because these things you see your pastors doing, even Judaism is a polluted, even Judaism did it. They desecrated the things of Moses. Jesus fought with the Pharisees because of how they twisted the things God gave Moses. They produced fake versions of what Moses did. So the oil Judaism now used was not the holy anointing oil of Moses. It wasn't. So, but they used the oil in their religious rituals to anoint praying for the sick. And I want to open your eye to something that you have never seen in Mark, in Mark chapter 6 and James chapter 5 verse 14. Give me your attention. You will never understand the Bible until you meet the, the author and you also understand the environment that the Bible was written. Now listen to me. Judaism when it emerged from what Moses, from the law of Moses. Do you know that the high priesthood became a political entity in the days of silence after the voice of God disappeared in Israel? I'll come and teach you those things later. After, what is it that happened from when the last prophet prophesied to when John the Baptist came up? It is called the Dark Ages. It was 400 years of silence where God never spoke. It was during that period that the Holy Anointing Oil disappeared. It was replaced by olive oil. They made another version. They broke the law of Moses and they began to use it to practice their religiosity because the real oil was missing. If you read the stories, the high priests, some high priests killed people. They assassinated people that were against them becoming high priests. The high priest office that was a template of Christ became political. A lot of killings happened. I'll come and share the history with you in future. Full details. I'll mention names of high priests and what they did. Now, so there was a lot of killings. So if you were God, will you leave your holy anointing oil on a high priest who that had become political? That they are now shedding people's blood and killing them, fighting for the post of becoming a high priest? You will not. So the real oil, oil, oil of Moses actually disappeared 400 years before Jesus came. Now, during that 400 years, a lot of errors were manufactured. Certain books of the Bible that people claim that missing books of the Bible were written during that period just to pollute and dilute the, the, the gospel. I mean, dilute what God gave the prophets to write. Listen carefully. That was when they manufactured the use of oil 
to, for the sick. So when Jesus came, he met a tradition where this perverted priest, high priesthood has invented oil in place of the holy anointing oil of Moses and they were now using it to anoint the sick. So in Mark chapter 6, when Jesus sent the disciples out, let's read it. Mark chapter 6. If you don't understand these background stories, you won't understand me when I say even Mark chapter 6 did not validate the use of oil. Because as of that time, that oil was no longer the oil of Moses, which God said should not be duplicated again. Mark chapter 6. Now listen. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote the same stories. So we're going to read the story in Mark chapter 6. Read the same story in the book of Luke. I will have taken to the book of Matthew. The same story. But no time because my time is up. We will read Mark and read Luke. So look at Mark chapter 6 verse 7. And he called the twelve to himself. And began to send them out two by two. And gave them power over unclean spirit. He did not say he gave them olive oil to anoint the sick. He gave them power over unclean spirit. Now the question is, how does God give, how, does, how did Jesus give them the power? The word power means authority. How, do, how did Jesus give them authority? Let's, John will give us an example. The Bible says he breathed unto them and said receive the Holy Spirit. So one way Jesus gave his disciples power was to breathe unto them. Another way was to speak to them, authorize them by, by righteous decrees. Go and do this. When the Bible says he gave them power, he did not say he gave them oil. Let's limit ourselves to the Bible because I know a bishop in Nigeria. I read his book, Oedipus book, I read it. He said, when, Jesus, when the Bible said Jesus gave them power, it was the oil Jesus gave them. And I begin to search the Bible. Where did Jesus give people oil? I couldn't find. I thought my own Bible is a different kind of Bible. I read, I went to other Bibles, look for it, I didn't. I said, where did Oyeriko get this thing from? That when Jesus gave them power, it was oil he gave them. The Bible says he gave them power. He didn't say he gave them oil. How does God give us power? By putting his Holy Spirit upon our lives. By authorizing us to do things. Not by giving us gadgets. So, he said he gave them power over unclean spirit. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bag, no bread, no copper in their money belt, but to wear sandals and not put on two tonics. Verse 10. Also, he said to them, in whatever place you enter, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. Mark these words, because we'll read the book of Luke later. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you, so they were going there to preach. When you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. This was Mark account of what even Luke witnessed. Why did God allow the four of them to write? So that what this person means, this one will gather it for us. The earth is established on the four corners of the earth. I mean the earth is established on four foundations. Now look at what the Bible says. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake up the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. As surely I say to you, it will be more terrible for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. That was all. That was, all. listen, listen, listen. Don't add anything to the Bible. That was all. He called them, gave them power, authorized them to go and preach the gospel. And he gave them the principles. Do not carry this. Do not carry that. Do not carry that. If you read the book of Matthew, he said, freely receive, freely give. Heal the sick, raise the dead. Now, they went. When these men went, they got to the field and fell back to what they were used to, the use of oil. They fell back to what they saw, the perverted 
perverted priests use. Because these guys were students of Judaism. If you read the story of each of them, some of them even knew that the Messiah was coming. That tells you they were schooled in Judaism. Listen carefully. Look at verse 12. So they went out and preached that people should repent. Verse 13. And they casted out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and heal them. Now, did Jesus give them the oil? No. They went out. Jesus did not follow them. If he had followed them, perhaps he would have told them, drop that thing. You already carry power. That oil is not the one that Moses made. But he never followed them. They went out. When they went out, they added use of oil to their ministry. Just as many pastors are called of God genuinely and they go out. They begin to add the teachings of firstborn. They begin to add the teachings of redemption of firstborn. They begin to undo what Jesus has done on the cross. They begin to ask the raising of altar. They begin to ask when they discover that ministry is no longer growing. They begin to look for what to preach for people to keep coming. For money to keep coming. When they discover that money is no longer coming, they begin to look for what to preach. For money to keep coming. So they added. The disciples added the use of oil. Jesus never gave them. They added. This is the Bible sense of it all. You don't read your own idea here. They added. There was no place where Jesus gave them oil. But how did oil appear? Because they added it. They added it because they saw that it has worked for the Pharisees. So they added it. Look at what Jesus said. He said, if you accuse me of casting out demons by Bezebub, who does your son cast them out? It means the sons of the Pharisees were using oil to cast out demons. Now, I mean, before Jesus came home, the sons of the Pharisees were using oil to cast out demons. So the disciples were used to that. They were used to seeing them, casting out demons with oil. So that's why they forgot that God has given them power. Just as I forgot in the 90s, that after being in crusade for like seven years, where I saw the power of God reigning, then I now go to Unipo Bible School and carried oil and added it to my anointing. Thank God, God met me and I threw it away. A preacher can be genuinely called of God and you now go about adding what is not part of the Christian faith. And people will be accepting what the preacher is saying because they know him as somebody who is called. Adding the nonsense and destroying the lives of people. The disciples are dead. But watch this. When they are dead, the result they got, they didn't get it because of the oil. They got it because of the authority Christ has given them already. You see that in the book of Luke. Go to Luke chapter 10. Let's see Luke's account. This was the 12th in Luke account. Sorry, let's see. Yeah, Luke chapter 9, sorry. Luke chapter 9. They called his 12 disciples together and gave them power. This is Luke chapter 9, Luke account. He gave them power over all demons. And to cure diseases. I repeat, how does Jesus give power? Is it by giving you oil? No. Speaking the word into your mouth, your life, breathing the Holy Spirit upon you. That was how he gave them power. So Luke account says he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. That was why they were able to heal the people. It wasn't because they used the oil. That was why they were able to cast out the demons. It wasn't because they used the oil. Look at what I realized. If you innocently carry the oil and you are using, God will be working miracle not because of the oil you are using, but because of his call upon your life. Then when he now come and tell you, now listen, when he, when he started working miracle because of the call upon your life, if you keep using the oil, the demonic will start mixing up with your ministry. So why God will be doing good things on one side, demons will be doing bad things on one side in the same church. If you don't hear the voice of God and drop the oil, a time is going to come that the activities of God will diminish completely and be wiped away. The activities of demons will be what will remain. 
because you have institutional, institutionalized the use of the oil. For most ministries that are using oil, the mixture is what you see. Demons, you see light and darkness mixed together. For most. And most of them that have used it for a long time, you see more of darkness than light. Light is always a facade. It's always, it's always a small screen. But when you go deep, you touch witchcraft. When you go deep into the ministries, you touch witchcraft. When you are still outside, you see light. But when you go deep, you touch witchcraft. So, the Bible says in verse 2, he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tonics. Whatever house you enter, stay there and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake up the dust from your feet and it, as a testimony against them. Is it not the same thing we read in the book of Mark now? So they departed and went to the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So Luke did not add them carrying oil because Luke was a medical doctor. Mark, task collector. They have, sorry, Mark was not a task collector. Matthew was a task collector. Luke was, was a medical doctor. So he understood. Remember, Luke wrote the book of Acts. Listen carefully. Luke wrote the book of Acts and wrote the book of Luke. He wrote these books after Jesus has died and resurrected. Why didn't Luke in include the oil that the disciples used? Why didn't he include it? Because acts has happened. The substance has arrived. The shadow is no longer needed. So in his writing, he deleted the shadow. But Mark did not because Mark was written earlier. Mark did not. Listen carefully. James was even the first book of the New Testament that was written. James was written far even before Matthew. James was written before Mark, written before Luke, written before John. The book of James. That is why James could tell the Jews. James didn't tell Gentile Christians to use oil because they don't know what is oil. Gentiles don't know what is oil, but Jews knew. So James wrote the book of James. If you read from chapter 1, okay, let's go there. James chapter 1. Look at, look at what the Bible says. James, verse 1, a born servant of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes, oh, which are scattered abroad. I repeat, James, a born servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes, which are scattered abroad. Are you one of the twelve tribes? Are you a Jew? And the Bible says in James chapter 5, the book of James has things that contain things that align with Christianity and also contain things that align with Judaism. The only thing in the book of James that align with Judaism, one, one that like is, oh yeah, the rest, it's why like the, the, like the one of faith. To me, James chapter 2 is the best, it's one of the best books of, of the Bible. Talking about faith that lack character is dead. That is Christianity for you. If James was writing this letter to Gentiles, James chapter 5 verse 14 will not be there. And if we, if we look at that James 5 14, was it the oil that healed the sick? No. Because the oil was, the oil that would have healed was no longer existing. Which is the holy oil of Moses. Which was not even meant to be poured on people's bodies. It was not existing. It was the oil that was composed during the political era of the high priest when there was silence in Israel. When the voice of God disappeared for 400 years. That was the oil that, that, that they were using. Their sons were using it to cast out spirit, demons. Listen. They were using it as holy oil. Why it was not? Look at James chapter 5. Verse 14. Let us read from verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Ah. Did he say let him raise an altar? 
Did he say, is anyone among you suffering? Let him raise an altar. Did he say, is anyone among you suffering? Let them baptize the person with oil. Let them serve in holy communion. Let them wash his feet. No. Let him pray. Let him talk to God. Present your request to God. He's going to answer you. If you need somebody to teach you how to talk to God, it means your suffering is not enough. Suffering will teach you what to tell God. Suffering. Suffering will put prayer point in your mouth. If your suffering has not given you prayer point, it is fake. Is either the suffering has stolen your brain or it's a fake suffering? People asking, hey man of God, my business is not moving. Give me prayer point. You are very stupid. If your business is not moving, that is enough prayer point. You don't need prayer point. If truly your business is not moving, tell God, Father, my the way you told me, man of God, tell God, my business is not moving. No. I am suffering. And God will answer you. The Bible says, let him pray. He now says, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? He's talking about the Jews so, that were scattered abroad. In another word, the Jews that were not living in Jerusalem, they were living in Italy, living in Lebanon, living in Syria, living in Rome, living in Greece, living in some part of Africa. They were scattered. But they came to the door of Pentecost and experienced Christianity and they became saved, quote unquote. And they went back to where they came from. James needed to write a letter to them to show them how to live the new life. So look at what he said. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Why? Because you are used to anointing oil. Maybe in the name of Moses, I don't know. But now do this in the name of the Lord. Look at the next statement. And the prayer of faith, not the oil. Which means they were not mature enough to pray the prayer of faith without the oil. James himself, who wrote this, show me the place in the Bible where he used oil. Peter, who carried oil in Mark, Mark chapter 6, show me when he used oil in Acts chapter 2. No. Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 10. No. If we pastors don't teach you how to pray prayer of faith without using the oil, we have set you up to be having intercourse with Nehushta, intercourse with the spirit of lawlessness. Because the oil you will be using will not be the holy oil that Moses made. You'll be using the polluted and adulterated oil, and you'll be calling it prophetic acts. Was this prophetic act? Tomorrow you will realize that authentic prophetic act, there's no use of oil in it. I repeat, authentic prophetic act, there is no use of oil in it. Because even in James chapter 5, verse 14, James did not say that you use the oil as a prophetic act. No. He said they, they should use the oil as a, a there's this thing in, in construction, a scaffold for their faith. So that you, the elders will be able to pray the prayer of faith standing on it. Then after that, please, grow up. Before Nehushtan will catch up with you, throw away the oil. Because the oil of Moses has even disappeared. Listen carefully. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. Not the oil. The prayer of faith. I challenge you today to start praying the prayer of faith without the oil. If you keep using the oil as a symbol of the Holy Spirit, you will start having intercourse with the spirit of lawlessness. Nehushtan, the great serpent, will become your companion. People who use oil, they always have dreams of snakes around them. Because they are touching Nehushtan. So why won't you see snakes around you? Let me wrap up with this scripture. Go to the book of Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus sent the 12. You see it? In Luke chapter 9, he sent the 12 and they went out. 
When they went out and returned, chapter 10, he now sent the 70 to follow the same pattern that the 12 used. But thank God the 70 didn't carry oil like the 12 did. The 12 must have come back and when Jesus heard that they carry oil, he said, ah, have you ever, I'm, just, I'm just speculating. And there's nothing wrong with speculating and checking the scriptures and reasoning. Okay, I'm just reasoning. They didn't just, I perceive they came back, ah, Father, even the demons. And Jesus said, come, did I ask you to use oil? Okay. How, why do I reason that Jesus must have rebuked them for using oil? Because in chapter 10 of the same look, when he sent the 70, they never, used, they never carried oil. It means when the 12 came back, the 12 were sent as a, as, as a litmus test for the 70. So when the 12 came back, he now discovered that when they went, they, they carried oil. He must have asked them, when you left this place, did I, did I give you oil? I gave you power. I gave you authority. Why do you fall back to the practice of the Pharisees? Okay. Now, 70, move. Join them. And they all joined and they went. The 70, none of them used oil. Why is it that Christians are looking at Mark chapter 6? They don't look at Luke chapter 9 and 10. Because when lawlessness enters you, he gives you preferred scriptures. I repeat, when lawlessness enters you, he gives you preferred scriptures. It doesn't allow you to be established in the whole counsel of God, where you check this scripture with this scripture. He gives you preferred scriptures. He gives you one scripture to stand on and display your error. Oh, all scriptures is inspiration of the Almighty. Ah. Look at what the Bible says in Luke. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also, after sending the 12. And send them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send our laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you as as lamb among wolves, carry neither money back, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the way. But whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if the son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. I remain in the same house, eating and drinking such as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Now, whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as they sent before you, and heal the sick there, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. Look at that word. The healing of the sick is a demonstration of the kingdom of God. They never held oil in their hands. They never held oil. Now they got it right. In Mark chapter 6, they did it. Mark chapter 6 and Luke chapter 9, they are the same thing. And I've told you why Luke never included the oil in his writing because Luke was now in Pentecost. The book of Luke was written after Pentecost. So he now saw the fulfillment of the holy oil of Moses. That was why he expunged it from his writing. Every preacher is supposed to expunge it, that practice out of their ministries. But we won't because that is what we use to zombify people. And steal their minds and steal their brains. So they'll be giving us a lot of money. Look at what the Bible says. He sent them out. Go forward. We are closing to verse 17. Then the 70 returned with joy. Saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Not, Lord, even the demons are subject to us by the oil. No, in your name. These are days of standing in the name of the Lord and unleashing the power of God. These are not days of carrying olive oil in your hands because olive oil is not the holy anointing oil that Moses composed and God instructed that it should never be repeated again in any generation. A generation that is bringing olive oil to you and calling it holy oil are giving you adulterated, polluted oil which God does not recognize. If you use what God does not recognize, you bring demons into your hands. My job is to warn my generation of these things. May God use these things that we have heard to keep building us up and giving us inheritance and more that are sanctified. By tomorrow, in the morning hours, I begin teaching because there are two sessions. 
I will com complete today's teaching tomorrow. Don't miss the service. Let us pray. Begin to lift up your voice and pray. Thanking God for tonight. Thank him for insight. Thank him for insight. Thank him for opening our eyes to behold wonderful things from his word. Bless his holy name for his marvelous deed. Begin to pray and reverse everything you may have brought upon your life using the fake oil you were calling holy anointing oil. Whatever you brought upon your life, there is power in the blood of Jesus for you to tap into right now and reverse it. Open your mouth and reverse it. Reverse everything the enemy may have wrought in your life by the use of the fake oil that they were calling holy oil. Reverse it. Lord, I decree a reversal. A reversal of every demonic thing that we unleash upon ourselves by this satanic practices by these things we did in ignorance we pray in your mercy you say your word in time of ignorance you overlook therefore we ask oh god that you reverse everything reverse everything reverse everything reverse everything in the name of jesus reverse everything in our lives oh god that we brought upon ourselves with the use of what is fake by following its thin ways, by following ways that you have abandoned, any intercourse with the spirit of lawlessness, Lord, we reject it. We decree, let it be reversed. Every affinity, every covenant with any realm of darkness, we command by the covenant in your blood, let it be broken. Any ruin that exists in our lives, we decree, let there be redemption in the name of Jesus. Any ruin that exists in our lives, let there be redemption. Let there be redemption. Let there be redemption in the name of Jesus. Any ruin that exists in our lives, let there be redemption. Any ruin that exists in our lives, let there be redemption. Any ruin that exists in our lives, let there be redemption in the name of Jesus. Holy Kaliba Satale. Let there be redemption against every ruin. Let there be redemption for every ruin. Let there be redemption for any ruin. Whatever things we have brought upon ourselves, we lay hold on the redemption that is in the blood of Jesus. We lay hold on the redemption that is in the blood of Jesus. We lay hold on the redemption that is in the in the blood of Jesus. We lay hold on the redemption that is in the blood of Jesus. We lay hold on the redemption that is in the blood of Jesus. We lay hold on the redemption that is in the blood of Jesus. We lay hold on the redemption that is in the blood of Jesus. We lay hold on the redemption that is in the blood of Jesus. We lay hold on it right now. In the name of Jesus. We lay hold on it right now. In the name of Jesus. We lay hold on it right now. In the name of Jesus. We lay hold on it right now. In the name of Jesus. We lay hold on it right now. In the name of Jesus. We lay hold on the redemption. We lay hold on the redemption. That is in Christ Jesus. We reverse and we revoke every activities of the wicked. We reverse and we revoke every activities of the wicked. We reverse and we revoke every activities of the wicked. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for this visitation. We thank you for this visitation. We pray let it be permanent. Let your Holy Spirit dot the eyes and cross the T's. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Tomorrow we are going to, it's going to be a strong deliverance service from the morning hours down to the afternoon hours where God is going to reverse everything people have brought upon their lives through the use of this demonic substance you are calling anointing oil. By breaking scriptures, we break our lives into pieces. So tomorrow don't miss the service. By 8.30, we 
We start our prayer by nine o'clock. I will start teaching immediately. I want to urge you not to miss the service. Be around. Don't say you want to follow on TV. This is not a TV thing. Except we are very far from Nairobi. Then God could, God will see your circumstances and minister to you right there in your house. But if you are within Nairobi, come to Kenkom between 6.30 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. and pick a bus. Can come here in Nairobi. Come there between 6.30 and 8.30 and join the bus. We have two classes of buses. There are buses where people pay for themselves. There are buses where the church pay for you. So you make sure you get to Kencom between 6.30 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. And do not miss tomorrow's service. Because I feel in my spirit, destiny is about being salvaged. God is going to walk in the life of those who have had intercourse with Nehushtan, the great serpent. And right now you see snakes all over. You pray, you feel snakes around your body because of Nehushtan. It's called the great serpent. So he's always there around people. Those are demonic spirits that manifest like snakes. I pray that the glory of God will descend tomorrow in a fire and consume those things and make sure that captivity is permanently broken in the name of Jesus. So see you tomorrow in church. Until then, sorry, we need to collect our offerings. I forgot that. Let's collect our offerings for, for today. And also those of you that have not made up your mind for the prophecy financing, please make up your mind and join us. And join us for the prophecy financing. But let's give our offering right now. Whatever the Lord lay in your heart to give, the pay bills are on the screen and um, other details are on the screen. Whatever the Lord lay in your heart to give, this is the time to give your offering. It could be a tithe you want to give, whatever. Let's, let's worship the Lord with our substance right now. In time of giving like this, don't slip into carnality. These monies are needed to pay the bills of this very station and keep us on air by the power of the Holy Spirit. So participate. Participate in this giving and um, be one of the sons of the kingdom of God who have accepted responsibility to carry the work of God on their shoulders. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for everyone who have given substance to you right now. I command a blessing upon their storehouse. I command job for the jobless. I command financial turnaround for those who are toiling. I command the blessing upon their storehouse. I command the blessing upon their storehouse. Let it sit and consume debt, consume lack, consume begging. In the name of Jesus Christ, let economic hardship be brought to an end right now. Let struggles be eliminated. Let businesses speak. Let families begin to rejoice with sufficiency in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Those of you who have not participated in the prophetic financing, I want to encourage you to send in your monies to 950-400. Tomorrow I'm going to pray for, for everybody who have given, but the giving expires on Monday. We'll pray for everybody, but the giving expires on Monday. So I want to encourage you to, to give. Number one is a million. Number two is 500,000. Number three is 300,000. Then we have 200,000. We have 100,000. We have 50. We have uh, 30. We have 20. We have 10. We have five. Sacrifice something. Whenever God calls for a sacrifice, not altar of sacrifice, but when he calls for a sacrifice to be offered for his assignment, his work, please sacrifice. 
because very soon the cloud will be full of rain and the rain will fall upon you. Sacrifice. That's not the time to be stingy. No, 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 no. That's not the time to consider about yourself. No, no, no. Like the widow of Zarephath, she, she gave us a standard. When God needed it, I should forget about myself. That is the standard for sons and daughters of the kingdom. When God needed it, I should forget about myself. When God needed it, I should forget about myself. That is the standard. So please, sacrifice. And tomorrow we'll be praying for everybody. I feel a release of financial blessings this season. So participate. Participate, sacrifice. Be part of these things. And those of us that are involved in the covenant, do not worry. Upper Saturday we'll have our covenant service. And I'll give you more details tomorrow. See you tomorrow in church. Until then, stay strong. And do not forget that Jesus is coming soon. Amen and amen. God bless you. You have been watching the School of Eternal Life coming to you live from the Morning Cloud TV Global Studios, courtesy of the Cry of the Spirit Ministries in Nairobi, Kenya. Join us next time for another session of the School of Eternal Life.